Hello everyone, today I'm doing a slightly different video. I'm taking a look at the fabled Batman the Animated Series Writer's Bible. This is a guideline that was provided to writers of the animated series to kind of set the tone and establish the characters. It's, it's basically the guides that all writers had to follow initially. Now the fun thing about this is that while it was developed by Bruce Timm, Paul Dini and Mitch Bryan, this version of the writer's bible is quite different uh, most of it was scrapped and it kind of gives us a glimpse into what the cartoon could have been before alan burnett joined the team and shook everything up so enough of my preamble let's go and take a look at this lovely document uh you can see here there's a but yeah you can see here's an illustration of batman so it kind of sets the tone of the design of the character some styles here showing Batman in motion and the font and we have the introduction night in Gotham City only the faintest rays of moonlight break through the steamy darkness steamy darkness hmm. shadows are black twisted and frightening the thick night air carries many sounds breaking glass sputtering neon harsh bitter voices and police sirens always police sirens most of Gotham's daytime inhabitants have long since fled to the suburbs or in security gated apartments. This is not a safe place after dark. One thing and one thing alone keeps Gotham from drowning in a sea of corruption and despair. It is a grim being cloaked as much in mystery as he is in shadows. Like a bat, he dives out of the night to feed on Gotham's evil. To some, he is merely a legend. To others, he is a dedicated, driven Avenger. And to criminals, he is their worst nightmare. He is Batman. Okay, so this introduction, so far, so same. There's nothing here that... Uh, contradicts what we saw in the TV show. So I feel like this nicely sets the tone as well because it's it's all about Gotham City, the, the place where all of the, the action will take place. And we can see a, a cool image here of Batman swinging through the, like the Art Deco skyscrapers. Really strong shadows here. I mean, I know it's been Xeroxed about a million times probably, so you've lost a lot of the detail, but it still looks really cool. So... <clears throat> General series concepts. The adventures of Batman will incorporate many different elements of the Batman mythology. Our half hour series will have a darker look and tone to it, keeping in line with the movie version and recent comic book interpretations. With a nod to the crime films and novels of the 1940s, we will combine both old and new in this dark deco visual design and create a fresh take on Batman. Yeah, so far, so accurate. What has changed? Chances are anyone who's reading this already knows a considerable amount about Batman. True. <laughs> For the past 51 years, he's been a major figure in everyone's childhood. His legend and lore have been told in comic books, radio, television and movies. Known to all is the story of his origin. Young Bruce Wayne, orphaned when a robber killed his parents, swore to devote his life and fortune to wipe out crime. He spent years traveling the world learning secrets of martial arts and criminology. With his training complete, Bruce Wayne returned to Gotham City, where he used high-tech gadgets, his brilliant detective's mind, and the fearsome costume of a Batman to wage war on the superstitious, cowardly members of the underworld. Now that we've dealt with his origin, we can put it out of the way for the remainder of the series. We'll say it here first. In the run of the series, we will do no stories about Batman's origin. Nothing about his parents' murder, the film they saw at the movies before they were shot, the theatre usher who happened to see them go into crime alley seconds before the gun went off, etc, etc. If you're thinking up stories along those lines, flush them. Granted, there's a tremendous history in Batman's early years, but that's been done to death in the comics, and it's not the Batman series we're doing today. What follows is a list showing how our Batman will differ from all the previous versions. Okay, okay, yeah, that's that's pretty accurate still. Batman is a solo act, usually working alone. Although he has allies in Alfred and Robin, it will be Batman who carries the bulk of every episode. Yep, that's correct. That is accurate. Batman does not work directly with the police. He's not a member of the force or a deputized agent. There's no bat signal or hotline. They can't contact him. <sighs> Initially, there wasn't a, uh, a bat signal and they weren't working with him, but yeah, they kind of quickly dropped that. Um... Batman's on a one-man fight against crime, and if he needs to inform the police of anything, he'll phone them. His closest contact on the force will be Commissioner Gordon, who, while he holds an admiration for the Dark Knight, will not always approve of his methods. Yeah, I don't know how accurate that is. 
Robin is not Batman's full-time partner, although adopted and trained to be Robin by Batman, Dick Grayson now leads a separate life as a college student and a solo crime fighter. That is true for the most part. <clears throat> Our stories will be hard-edged crime dramas with villains who play for keeps. Yes, many of them will come from Batman's well-known rogues gallery, but they will be as wild, dark, and sinister as we can make them. Each episode will also include a big set piece, an incredible visual action visual that will be a <laughs> look forward to element in each show. <laughs> Just laughing at the visual action visual. God, that's hard to say. Try saying that 10 times with a mouthful of hot chips. Uh, this will be the climax centerpiece, our showstopper of each episode. Yeah, that is, that's pretty accurate so far. The writing style and structure. Our series will stress economic, well-structured plots containing snappy, conversational dialogue and characters whose actions are motivated and believable. We want expository information conveyed as visually as possible, stressing visual shorthand over lazy expository speeches. I, I think in some regards they, they succeeded there, in, in other regards maybe not so much. Uh, we hope to encourage our writers to take advantage of the, mo the almost limitless visual possibilities allowed by animation. With our animated Batman, we can build gigantic sets and create special effects that could never be realized with live action. Use this advantage. That is, that's pretty accurate, yes. We encourage writers to push themselves to create action and fight sequences in these larger than life settings. Keep the images and action clear and vivid. Give us detail that will inspire the directors and animators. Utilize the power of the written word. We wish to pay special attention to the arena or setting of each episode. Stories which have a unified sense of place will always work better. That's not to say that Batman can't move around in his, in his adventures, but the locations, especially the climax, should be adequately established and foreshadowed. Don't forget we have 65 episodes, so there's no reason to throw kitchen sink and all into every episode. We want to strive for identifiable, memorable adventures that audiences will want to see over and over again, as with the Flash of Superman series. Yeah, I, I, I suppose that's pretty accurate. The only thing is they said they had 65 episodes, but they ended up doing about 100 if you count New Batman Adventures. But, you know, they didn't know that at the time. So I'm going to say that's accurate. Three act structures. Structurally, we want these 22 minute episodes to function as uniformed, tightly plotted mini movies. We hope to follow a cinematic three act structure with each act containing action sequences and plot developments that build towards a final conclusion. In particular, we'd like each story to contain a major action set piece, usually in the third act. That's pretty accurate. The first third of the script should serve the requirements of the first act. That is the setup where the episode's tone and story direction are established, as well as introducing characters and establishing their agendas. Act two, the second third will compromise the second act. Okay, <laughs> where the story develops, tension increases, counter moves by the adversaries take place and rising action becomes unstoppable and headed for the inevitable conclusion. The final third will deal with the climax and resolution of the story. Whatever is established in Acts 1 and 2 must be paid off and resolved here. In the search for a satisfying ending, we always remember to save something big for the third act. The action must always build to a big finish. Yep, I, I think they stuck with that pretty closely through the whole series apart from the two parts i suppose but uh, even then each individual part had their own uh, three act structure i'd say act break cliffhangers at the end of each act will be a commercial break we want to be sure that we have some kind of cliffhanger sting or revelation when we fade out for the commercial obviously we can't always have batman hanging off a cliff but try and utilize creative ways to keep the audience hooked so that they will stay tuned Generally speaking, I think they were pretty successful with that. Humor guidelines. The humor in our version of Batman should arise naturally from the larger than life characters and, and never from tongue in cheek campiness. Mm. Dry lines in tough situations and occasional comments about the outlandishness of costume villains is certainly within the realistic context of our vision of Batman. As for the villains, dark humor and clever dialogue is great as long as it seems to realistically reflect the character's wit as opposed to the writer's. Of course, everybody shouldn't sound like the Joker, and writers are encouraged to find distinctive voices for all of their characters. As an additional note, we want to keep pop culture references to a minimum. Occasional satire of significant cultural trends along the lines of the more recent comic incarnations is fine, but should be kept to a minimum. After all, this is Batman, not Jonathan Swift. 
Remember, we want the humour to hold up in 10 or 20 years, so we'd like to stay away from specific references that won't be relevant in the future. Well, I, I, I'd say they pretty much succeeded at that. Um, immediately when I think of the humour, I think of Heart of Ice's scene where Mr. Freeze pulls up outside of the, the Goth Court building in his massive truck with the ice cannon, and the little busboy runs up and goes, Keys? Very amusing. And not at all dated. Unless we get rid of cars and everything's self-driving in the future, in which case it will seem quaint. But anyway. Uh, okay, so let's get to the, the meat here by looking at the characters. So first of all, of course, we have Batman. The Batman will be portrayed as Gotham's grim avenger of evil, appearing only at night. He will use his sophisticated gadgetry, shrewd detective skills and frightening image to combat Gotham's criminals. He will speak only when necessary and only in short, terse sentences. Although mistakenly viewed as a vigilante, the Batman is bound by a code which forbids killing. He may terrorise a criminal by hanging him over the ledge of a building, but he'll never lower himself to a criminal's level and murder. Our version of Batman will rely less on gadgets and more on his own deductive powers and fighting skills. Staying true to the Batman's original conception as the world's greatest detective, we want to stress his mental abilities, whether he be assembling clues in a case or using his vast scientific knowledge in the Batcave's laboratory. And he said lavatory then. <laughs> now there's an image. Um, he is a crime fighter who is skilled in many languages and is also a consummate master of disguise. In addition to Bruce Wayne, the Batman has other alter egos, including... Slugger Sprang, a small-time hood with an ear to the criminal grapevine of Gotham's seedy docks. Now, I assume that name Slugger Sprang is a reference to Dick Sprang, um, but he never appeared in the animated series, so eh, eh, not in there. Will I do that noise every time there's something inaccurate in here? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'll probably get bored of it, frankly. Uh, anyway, continuing. This mental agility also applies to the Batman in action. When faced with a dangerous situation, he won't always be able to produce the right tool to remove himself from harm's way. More often than not, it's razor-sharp wits that spring him from a trap, not a utility belt. His fighting skills combine elements of judo, jiu-jitsu, karate, and old-fashioned street fighting. Although skilled in martial arts, Batman's distinct fighting style is not expressly oriental. Fear is one of the Dark Knight's most powerful weapons, and through his mysterious persona, he is able to cultivate an almost superhuman image for himself. Through sheer physical speed, a bat-shaped hang glider, and sophisticated weapons such as the Batarang and smoke grenades, he perpetrates the image of an invincible foe, a mysterious figure seemingly impervious to bullets, able to fly and capable of appearing out of nowhere. So, okay, nearly all of that is pretty accurate. The only thing that didn't make it is old slugger sprang oh, okay there's more okay other weapons contained in batman's utility belt are skeleton keys handcuff handcuffs even lightweight unbreakable rope tiny electronic trackers and a radio transmitter batman also utilizes the bat boat connected to gotham harbor via an underground river and the bat wing a small fighter jet which is launched horizontally like a harrier jump jet and is able to hover accurate in our series, Batman is in the early phases of his crime-fighting career, often at odds with the police, many of whom regard him as a vigilante and menace to the city. Few besides Commissioner Gordon realise the powerful guardian Gotham has in Batman. That's, yeah, kind of, sort of, at least initially. Um, once they introduced the Bat-Signal, that was it. God, I'm trying to remember what episode they introduced it in. Was it um, Cape and the Cow Conspiracy, I think? Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the Cape and the Cowl Conspiracy, which in itself was an adaptation of one of the Batman uh, comic books. I forget which number of Detective Comics it was, but it had a, a cover of Batman like being drenched in wax. Uh, anyway, moving on. So we've got some, some more uh, sketches by Bruce Timm of Batman here. All right, let's move on to Bruce Wayne. One thing which we will stress and will make our series markedly different is the fact that Bruce Wayne is the disguise and Batman his true persona. In the eyes of Gotham City's populace, Bruce Wayne is the last person to ever be associated with the crime-fighting Batman. His public image is that of a jaded, jet-setting playboy. To the public at large, he's a man whose wealthy parents were murdered when he was a child and who spends all of his time frivolously squandering the Wayne fortune. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know if... if the public would view Bruce Wayne 
as Jay did, but certainly did view him as a, a jet setting playboy. I'll give that as a kind of meh, half accurate. To make sure he isn't thought of as a rich do-gooder, Wayne maintains his snobbish, indifferent facade by hiding his sizable charity contributions behind dummy corporations. This self-centered image clears him of any suspicion and allows him to finance his crime-fighting operations through the inexhaustible Wayne family fortune. When Bruce Wayne is out of the public eye, his personality immediately returns to that of Batman. So that first half is not accurate because we see in uh, The Forgotten, Bruce Wayne's there peeling potatoes at a homeless shelter. Yeah, he's, he's not hiding his, his charity. He's just not making a big deal out of it. Or I should say his charitable contributions. Um, but when Bruce Wayne is out of the public eye, his personality does immediately return to that of Batman. Yes. Although the public persona of Bruce Wayne often causes him to be labelled as a selfish elitist, this is the price Bruce Wayne is willing to pay for being Batman. He is not a man haunted by the ongoing trauma of losing his parents. He has exercised those goats... Those goats. <laughs> he has exercised those ghosts by becoming Batman. Bruce Wayne has sacrificed his public life for a private life of crime fighting. Ultimately, he is more comfortable as the Batman, and that is who our series is about. Yeah, again, that's kind of half right. Um, I don't think Bruce Wayne was really labelled a selfish elitist by anyone except for Dr. Long in uh, Nothing to Fear. Um, yeah, I can't really think of anything else, any, any other examples of that. Um, but yeah, ultimately, he is more comfortable as Batman. So yeah, that's mostly accurate. And look, there's Bruce Wayne. Look at it, that nice smile. Isn't he happy? <laughs> Some more Bruce Wayne sketches by Bruce Tim. Okay, let's go on to the supporting characters. None of the supporting characters listed are required to make regular appearances in the series. In our series, we intend to stress clean, streamlined storytelling and have no desire to pad the episode with unnecessary characters. Robin. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess that was true of the first 65, yes. And I do find it amusing that Robin is like the first character they get to immediately as... Uh, <laughs> what was it? Unnecessary padding. <laughs> Anyway, so let's let's talk about their version of Robin. Dick Grayson was born into a circus family as part of the Flying Graysons. He excelled early on at all forms of acrobatics. When his parents were murdered by a gangster trying to extort money from the circus, Dick was adopted by Bruce Wayne. Having lost his own parents to crime, Wayne felt a kinship with the young orphan and trained him to be his assistant and partner, Robin. Ding, ding, correct. <laughs> In our series, Dick Grayson will be older than classic depictions of Robin, and he will not be Batman's full-time partner. Our Robin will be about 20, and he'll operate pretty much as a solo adventurer and crime fighter. Of course, he will still have very close ties to Batman and Bruce Wayne, and Batman will call him in on cases from time to time. Ding, ding, correct. As Robin, Dick possesses keen reflexes, acrobatic skills and strength and endurance that make him second only to Batman. He's also much more verbal than Batman and will occasionally taunt criminals while he's fighting them. Note. Robin will not engage the hoods with witty repartee and puns. He's actually kind of a smart ass, egging them <laughs> smart ass. Smart ass, excuse me. Egging them to take their best shots and then decking them. Yeah, I'd say that was pretty accurate. I immediately think of the episode Bane, where he's tied up in, in the pool. And uh, once he gets released, he he kind of calls the Candice to come and have a shot at fighting him and <laughs> she beats him up. <laughs> Uh, Robin enjoys the thrill of crime fighting and Batman sometimes has to restrain him from charging into action without considering every deductive angle first. This is indicative of their relationship as Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson as well. Though Dick also lost his parents to crime, he is not driven by Batman's same demons. Batman may use the Bruce Wayne persona as a cover, but Dick Grayson and Robin are pretty much the same young man. By day, Dick will attend college at Gotham State where he majors in criminology. He'll live at the campus dormitory but will make periodic visits to Wayne Manor to help Batman on a case or to check up on his friend's well-being. Dick knows that Batman's war on crime brings him close to the edge and makes it part of his job to lighten things up when things get too intense. Dick shares a special kinship with Alfred, who he looks up to as a combination of kindly uncle and wise mentor. Someone to relate to in the son-to-father way when the Batman is otherwise occupied. And we can see here some early designs for Robin. 
notice his hair is quite different and uh, those little like paddy bits, I'm pretty sure they weren't present in the final design, if I remember rightly. Uh, this is very accurate to the comics, I suppose, because Neil Adams had just recently redesigned Robin's costume to get rid of the little tights, uh, trunks, I should say, and bare legs and added like trouser legs and all these things, all these little padded bits on the side. Um, but yeah, I mean, so far that's that's fairly accurate. There's nothing in there really that made me go, oh no, that was completely wrong. And there we go, there's the updated design. Yeah, I was right, got rid of the, the little padding there and his hairstyle is more accurate. Okay. All right, on to Alfred. <clears throat> Other than Robin, Wayne Manor's trusted butler, Alf, <laughs> this is Alfred. Maybe it's just a, a bad copy. Anyway, other than Robin, Wayne Manor's trusted butler, Alfred, is the only person to know Bruce Wayne's secret identity. A longtime friend to Bruce's father, Alfred understands Wayne's grief and his desire to fight crime. Although concerned with Wayne's safety, he realizes that risks must be taken and considers himself part of Batman's operation. Alfred knows that his master is often uncomfortable with the boorish Bruce Wayne persona, and Alfred's wicked dry wit is obvious in the easing of this tension through his orchestration of the Wayne charade. He controls Wayne's daily routine with utmost attention to detail, often going so far as to select Wayne's wardrobe and oversee his social calendar. Yes, yes, he does. Although, frankly, Alfred, you did a poor job because you were always picking out that same brown suit. I feel like he was shirking his responsibilities a bit there. Uh, a man of impeccable taste, Alfred might, for instance, select an array of truly tasteless ties and, and take great pleasure in outfitting Bruce Wayne with a gauche garments. Alfred's humour is priceless to the Batman, who sometimes admits his own tendency towards being too serious. Alfred often needles Batman about a hero's work never being done, and the obvious humour behind his beloved friend dressing up as a bat is not lost on Alfred. But without the jokes, Alfred is firmly committed to the Batman and his mission, and the men are deeply bonded by this shared goal. Alfred is equally efficient in maintaining the illusion of Batman and Bruce Wayne as different people. Always vigilant at Wayne Manor when Batman is out on a case, he minds the phones and gates, making sure Wayne seems to be at home, but unable to come to the phone. At other times, when Wayne is abroad, he craftily executes fake sightings of Batman to further deflect suspicion. So this last point here, ah, uh, not really. I mean, kind of, yes, but no. There weren't really any examples of of Alfred uh, crafting fake sightings of Batman while Bruce Wayne's away. Um, but he did man the phone, so yeah, kind of. You can also see in this design here, he's a bit... Um, well, he has dark hair, and he's got kind of a slightly pudgier face. Uh, we'll probably see an updated design in a minute. Well, there he is with white hair. He still doesn't quite look right. It's the, the jaw, I think. Doesn't quite look right to me. Maybe I'm just reading into it too much. But anyway, moving on to Commissioner Gordon. World-weary and politically uncorruptible, middle-aged Commissioner Gordon is loved by the law-abiding populace of Gotham and hated by its criminal element. A pipe-smoking Irishman who is both tough and fair, Gordon has been a cop all his life, working his way up from beat cop to detective sergeant and finally captain. So no pipe was allowed, but other than that, broadly. Uh, I don't think they ever got into his his heritage, but uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a redhead, so. Hoping to make him more amenable to police corruption, the crooked former mayor of Gotham kicked him upstairs with the appointment to commissioner. But the plot backfired. Gordon forever endeared himself to the public and the patrol cops by walking into his first day on the job in his patrolman's dress uniform, sending a clear signal to the administrative suits that he was not one of them. That was never shown. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it was never discussed. He still holds uniform beat cops in special regards which fosters resentment among both plainclothes cops and city politicians. Despite the turmoil around him, Gordon is a compassionate man and believes in the intrinsic good of human nature. Nevertheless, he's a pragmatist and knows that he must be unsparingly tough on violent crime, but is equally adept at choosing which battles to fight and when. He knows that in a city as big as Gotham, there must be some give and take. He's a harried, overworked man drowning in a sea of administrators, a blue-collared cop, who must function in a white collar world in order to fight the crime of Gotham. Although he'd rather be retired and fly fishing, his personal integrity and sense of duty will not allow him to even consider leaving this job. Although Gordon cannot publicly condone Batman, 
He secretly welcomes his intervention and is often contacted for clandestine meetings by the Dark Knight. Yeah, I, I, I won't say that any of this information is inaccurate. It's just they never really went into it. The only thing that is uh, perhaps not fully accurate, I suppose, is the uh, not publicly condoning Batman because he does several times. And a lot of his meetings aren't exactly secret. Uh, never one to suffer fools gladly, Gordon is uncomfortable with politicking, although he often finds himself rubbing elbows with Gotham's rich and powerful. Because of this, Gordon often comes into contact with Bruce Wayne. Gordon feels that Wayne is an irresponsible playboy and never says more to him than necessary. The Batman's respect and admiration for Gordon must always be hidden when disguised in the Bruce Wayne charade, for Batman knows that if Wayne and Gordon were to be friends, Gordon would surely get his alter ego. The only friendship that can exist is that of Gordon and the Batman. So that is inaccurate. There are several times where, particularly in the new Batman adventures and uh, Sub-Zero, where Bruce Wayne and Commissioner Gordon are socialising and seem chummy. Gordon has a wife, Sarah, as well as an 18-year-old daughter, Barbara. Barbara's schoolgirl crush and desire to meet Batman has inspired her to try her hand at crime fighting as Batgirl. Whereas most teenagers might sneak out of the house for a midnight rendezvous, Barbara dons a costume and slips into the night to search for the Batman. On one or two occasions, she'll, she will run into the Dark Knight and Robin, unwittingly putting them all in danger. So Gordon's wife, Sarah, never appeared. Um, wasn't even mentioned. Barbara's mother was never mentioned. Um, and yeah, the Batgirl origin mentioned there is sort of a little bit, maybe, but not quite. Um, Shadow of the Bat had a, a different origin for her where she impersonated Batman to a period of rally to free Commissioner Gordon after he was falsely imprisoned on corruption charges. Um, and then she ended up in a situation where she was partially unmasked and her hair was exposed and everyone was like, oh, look, it's a Batgirl. And then she just kind of took it from there. Um, but yeah, this design of Commissioner Gordon, that's Commissioner Gordon that I know. Yeah, more Commissioner Gordon. Okay, so here we go. Officer Rene Montoya. Like Bruce Wayne, Rene Montoya lost someone near her to Gotham's criminal element. That reads weirdly. Her husband, also a police officer, was killed two years ago in the line of duty. She has continued on as a legitimate crime fighter. She grew up in Gotham's crime alley and saw firsthand what criminal lifestyles did to people. Young, tough and cynical with a dry sense of humour, she holds a grudging respect for the Batman, but has mixed emotions about his vigilantism. Nevertheless, they often find themselves thrown together as allies, and Batman's knowledge of her past causes him to be particularly fond of her. Right, so, all of this, it was never really touched upon in the show, but the tie-in comics, particularly Batman The Adventures Continue, which is written by Paul Dini, completely scraps all of this um in batman adventures continue Rene montoya is an open lesbian uh and i've forgotten her girlfriend's name i want to say daria i could be mistaken um and her husband was never mentioned in the show um i gather that montoya was envisaged as having a bigger part in the series but she kind of outside of pov she wasn't really in it very much um, and also, she never really showed anything but respect for Batman, I think. So this this description is the first big eh, eh, I think. Uh, she hates Bruce Wayne and everything he stands for, inclined to spend off-duty time in volunteer work at St. Joan's Catholic Church. She believes that Wayne is selfish and deaf to the cries of Gotham's poor. She wishes she had kids and has a real soft spot for them, as well as a strong dedication to her family. Eh, eh. I'm going to be doing that a lot. It's going to get really annoying. So I'm going to stop, actually. Let's stop doing that and just say no. Despite her cynical facade, she has idealistically sworn herself to work within the confines of the law and unfortunately finds herself at odds with Batman's methods. She secretly dreads the day where she might be faced with the task of having to arrest Batman. Yeah, I, I don't think Montoya was cynical at all in the show. Um, She may very well secretly dread the day that she had to arrest Batman but no there's no sign of that so Montoya's the first character here where just everything is <laughs> not wrong but basically scrapped 
I can see you can see in this sketch here that she had possibly longer hair at some point, but they decided to kind of tie it back. Uh, okay, let's go on to Harry Bullock. They got his name wrong. It's Harvey Bullock. Come on, that's that, that's a huge mistake. I'm, I'm outraged. <laughs> okay, so on the other hand. Harvey Bullock would just as soon shoot Batman as arrest him. A rogue detective who gets results, he employs some of the same scare tactics as the Batman and then some. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fairly accurate, apart from the name. Come on, Harvey, Harvey. Crass, unkempt, and genuinely unpleasant to be around, Bullock has few close friends on the force beyond his loose gang of toadies. He has a mercilessly cruel sense of humour and sees himself as a real guy's guy. A loud sports nut who always has a filthy joke to tell. Despite all of this, he is not stupid. He is cunning, shrewd and able to think like a crook. Perhaps because he gets results, there is something intriguing about the guy. You can't take your eyes off him, maybe out of disbelief. Believing his badge is a legal license to break the rules, he resents Batman as an unauthorised meddler who is muscling in on his territory. Deep down, he's probably irked that nobody screams police brutality at Batman like they do to him. <laughs> but Bullock's good enough to stay just inside the law, where the knee jerks and superiors can't touch him. Despite Gordon's dislike of Bullock, he is, in the mayor's words, a necessary blunt instrument. The Batman doesn't agree. I mean, yeah, that's fairly accurate, I'd say. Um... You didn't really see any allies of Bullock in the show. Uh, don't think he had any cop buddies. Closest thing he had was Montoya. Um, but yeah, he is rough around the edges. And yet yeah, that's that's him. Looks a bit like Fred Flintstone, doesn't he? But chomping on a cigar. Now the cigars, I don't think they had him smoking cigars in the show, did they? No, they didn't. Okay, moving on to Mayor Hamilton Hill. Fearing loss of voters with pro-Batman citizens, Mayor Hill is too spineless to declare all-out war on the Batman. Nevertheless, he despises the Batman's vigilante tactics, denying his impact on, on the slight drop in Gotham's crime rate. Knowing the divided feelings for Batman and Gotham, Hill isn't afraid to rally behind Batman either, when the time is politically right. But he still resents Batman as somebody out of his control. In fact, when Hill's child is kidnapped by the Joker in order to set a trap for the Batman, Batman saves the child and Hill's only comment is that if Batman hadn't existed, his arch enemy Joker wouldn't have snatched the boy in the first place. This sort of blind hatred of Batman creates a special bond between Detective Bullock and Mayor Hill. So that is partially accurate, um, if anything. Uh... I think Hill came to respect Batman more after that incident. I guess because the plot changed that his son Jordan ran away with the Joker rather than being kidnapped. Uh, I believe it's because child endangerment was a big no-no according to the censors. Anyway, Hill is not above giving out and receiving political favours and is a man who has working relationships with both friends and enemies making him all the more dangerous. Yeah, I mean, that one's fairly accurate. Uh, Hamilton Hill, fairly ineffective. Okay, Summer Gleason, the nightly anchor person of Inside Gotham, a sort of current affairs tabloid news show. Summer reports the most sensational of Gotham's news. Whether hard news or feature fluff, she reads it with an eye towards the scandalous and fantastic. In addition, when out on assignment, her gonzo journalism puts her at odds with both Batman and the Gotham Police Department. Yeah, she sounds like a, a character that's been scaled back in the, the final show, actually. Um... I can only think of perhaps two episodes where she had more of a role outside of just being a face on TV, providing exposition. Let's say three, actually. Let's say, yeah. So Christmas with the Joker, where she was kidnapped by the Joker, along with Bullock and, and Commissioner Gordon. Nothing to fear, where she was talking to Dr. Long, who then insulted Bruce Wayne. And uh, a bullet for Bullock, where Bullock went to her for information. Uh, Summer's dream interview is an exclusive with the Batman and her ultimate scoop would be the unmasking of the Dark Knight. She has put journalistic ethics on the back burner until she makes it into the big time and really believes that once she moves out of Gotham, she'll behave more like a serious journalist. Although her misguided dream will remain unfulfilled, she keeps busy in Gotham, paying particular attention to the many villains who relish the spotlight and are willing to be interviewed, much to the Batman's chagrin. 
Uh, yeah, this is never touched upon, and I don't think she ever interviews any villains. And the closest she comes to it is in Feet of Clay Part 2, where she has Roland Daggett on her show, uh, Gotham Tonight, I think it was. Uh, her scandal-prone tactics as she covers Gotham's rich and famous bring her into contact with Bruce Wayne. She is convinced that he, like all the other rich and famous, must have something to hide, and his arrogant, unflappable exterior presents a challenge to her. He, on the other hand, couldn't care less about Summer Gleason, which makes her even more determined to find out what he's hiding. Yeah, that was never touched upon. Um, closest thing I can think of is in Lockup, where Summer Gleason and Bruce Wayne are having lunch, and they seem perfectly chummy there. So I'm going to give that a... Eh, eh. I said I'd stop doing that, and yet here I did it again. Major settings, Gotham City. Gotham is a sprawling industrial crime-ridden city rife with political corruption and served by an understaffed police department. Modeled loosely after New York, it has large central park, museum, universities, opera house, and countless skyscrapers. When in doubt, writers are advised to keep New York in mind and then exaggerate it. Now that is very accurate. They definitely did that. A caste-like system exists in terms of Gotham skyscrapers with the rich and powerful living high above the squalor of the city. In these lower depths can be found Gotham's notorious crime alley where Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered. With the active shipping port in Gotham Harbour, the city's wharf promised safe exit and entry to a steady stream of international criminals seeking sanctuary. Whereas New York Harbour welcomes visitors with the Statue of Liberty, Gotham's welcoming structure is the rocky island housing Stonegate Penitentiary. Despite this ominous visual warning, corrupt city bosses have turned certain districts into gangland strongholds and a constant war is being waged for control of the, of the Gotham's gambling business. On the outskirts of town can be found the Arkham Asylum for the criminally insane, where such dangerous criminals as the Joker and Two-Face reside. Although most of our stories will take place in Gotham City, we will occasionally follow the glove, <laughs> the glove trotting, I think they mean globe trotting, Bruce Wayne, to distant locations which will serve as settings for additional Batman adventures. Yeah, most of this is, is fairly accurate. Um, I don't think they ever expressly said that Stonegate was on an island, uh, just on the coast. Uh, but yeah, it could very well be on an island. They never said it. It definitely wasn't. I was just thinking about the glove trotting Bruce Wayne. <laughs> uh, okay, so next we've got some uh, images of Gotham. Very nice stuff here. That this one in particular really conveys the the sense of height of the skyscrapers. Those like sheer straight lines that almost feel like you're you're going straight down in a way. And you can see the cars there as little tiny ants. Uh, and then that's just some buildings. More buildings. I mean, it's a shame that these have been photocopied so much that they're actually very hard to, to discern because the actual artwork itself is amazing. And that's the, that's Crime Alley there. But I think that's the nightmare version of it rather than the real world one because it's it's very angular, like um, like a German expressionistic film. Like the buildings are wonky with oddly shaped windows and crooked uh, paths. Yeah, is that a train? I'm not into no, that's a bridge, isn't it? Yeah, it's. I have to crane my head to look at this sideways when it's like this. Um, okay. More skyline. All right, so I think this is the last location that I'm going to talk about before ending this part of the video because it's going quite long. Uh, the Batcave. Resting below Wayne Manor via elevator or gigantic winding staircase, the Batcave is comprised of several enormous caverns beneath the 150-acre Wayne estate. Smaller caves connect the caverns and provide several disguised exit caves at various ends of the Wayne estate. This network of cave extends to the edge of Gotham City, and Batman has constructed a conduit that allows him to travel into the catacomb-like sewers of Gotham City. An underground river that empties into Gotham Harbor allows quick access to the ocean via the sleek Batboat. Yes, the Batboat does have access to the ocean from the underground rivers. Uh, they never really showed him accessing the sewers through the Batcave. Otherwise, why would he bother driving above the surface if he could just sneak around down there and then pop out where he wanted to be? The Batcave houses a chemical forensics laboratory, mechanical garage, engineering areas, trophy room, and a sophisticated video surveillance system where the Batman can watch not only Wayne Manor, but the streets of Gotham. This allows him to often catch crimes in progress and with the speed of Batman, nab the crooks before they finish. 
that last point, no, they never showed that. Um, the Joker had a surveillance system where he was spying on prominent people in Gotham, but Batman never seemed to have that. There we go. There's a nice illustration of the Batcave. And this is Wayne Manor. So one of the things I like about Wayne Manor is that it's almost... It's hard to see in this image, but it's almost got the profile of Batman. Like if you look at the, the doorway here, you can see that those are like the points of Batman's ear. Um, I like how they incorporated the, the bat motif into the building. If I were to ever build a house from scratch, and like if I had millions and millions of pounds, I would basically have to rebuild this version of Wayne Manor because it's cool. Right, okay. And then there's a picture of the bat computer or one of the back computers with the Batmobile in the background and the stairway leading up to Wayne Manor. And more of the Batcave. So I'm going to end this video here and I'll be back in my next video looking at the villains. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more to discuss here because some of these villain origins are very different to what we saw in the final show. But thanks for watching. Take care.